So, without further ado, over to you. Lee. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I was hoping to give you a bit of insight into the weather, particularly sort of uh, frontal systems and, uh, and upcoming sea breezes as we get into the changing season. Um, but obviously, um, as a weather forecaster, I, I love the weather um, and have used it now in both uh, small course dinghy racing, having supported the British team, but also having just um, sailed around the world. But I just thought I'd start with a, with a little clip of uh, some of the reasons why the weather is uh, so different and also uh, why it's so important. It's a long haul. You lose touch with the real world. It's a big team, a small boat, but it can be a lonely place. It's an endless marathon. It's relentless. You become a better sailor, you try to become also a better person. Just like an Ironman triathlon, there's nothing really fun about doing it, but it's the reward that you reap at the end of it that makes it all worthwhile. It's amazing what the mind and body can cope with. I was the coldest I've ever been at times. I was the tiredest I've ever been. But you just knew that what we were doing was the coolest thing we'll probably ever do. The thoughts about a female crew, that they are not good enough to beat the male team because they are not strong enough, they are not tough enough, and they don't have the willpower to win. And I think it's completely wrong. It's just a sort of snippet of uh, some of the weather conditions, obviously, experience going, going around the world. And um, it, was a, it was a different uh, strategy employed um, to some extent when you uh, take on, a, on a, an adventure like that or a, a race like that versus some of the more smaller racing. But I would say it's definitely uh, increased my knowledge and. Um, and help me realize how, you know, it's always relevant. And uh, even though we were doing a big boat race and sailing miles and miles and miles, the real small things down to the individual clouds, making us go, you know, gaining just that small distance was still a, a huge impact the entire time round. And so I think, you know, it, it was just a, a sort of example of how, uh, how everything is still related to, doesn't matter what size you're doing uh, in terms of race, whether it's a coastal race, it's a, a one mile, uh, fast and furious stadium race. Um, every little bit, every meter is always uh, is is what always matters. And um, hopefully, from you know, and from the weather, there's a there's a huge amount that could be gained, or also there's a huge amount that we can understand to try and minimise our losses. Because as some as uh, as was said at the introduction, there it is a bit of a dark art. It's not fully understood. So um, it's kind of working out what we do know, and when we know something for fact, how we can actually then use it, and when we don't know something, how we can just almost minimise our losses or or make the most of the situation. So um, as as has already said, I I formerly worked for the um, RYA as um, as their British uh, as the Olympic um, forecaster. Um, I've done a, a lot of sailing myself. I came up through all the youth dinghies, went to the youth worlds, went into Olympic classes, did a bit of 470 sailing, and then went sort of keelboat racing. I generally now race with my um, with my with my dad in a in a in a J92 down in Hamble, um, and also I've just sort of uh, gone and raced around the world in um, in the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, and, uh, you know, one of my main reasons for being part of that, I was the navigator on board, but obviously the skill set I brought to that was, was my weather forecasting background. Um, and so hopefully um, I'm going to be able to uh, give you an insight into a bit of the weather. Um, but rather than just talking about the theory and, uh, and going through it, I think one of the big things I wanted to sort of introduce to everyone was um, actually talking about the weather in terms of type of day. Because, yes, we can all talk about fronts and showers and, oh, yeah, front came through. But actually, how does, how does the weather actually rate, rate, relate to me on my race course? How am I going to use that to go better, to go faster, um, or to, to, to make a gain? So it's kind of taking the theory and then putting it into a, a more practical and usable, uh, usable piece of information or tactical use. Uh, on any given day. So we're sort of going to go through um, a variety, uh, a variety of, of, 
variety of weather situations, but with the idea of classifying them into, into a type of day that then we can use to, into a more tactical um, situation. So essentially, I've, I've broken down the weather, and uh, this is a fairly, fairly common, you see it in a lot of, a lot of textbooks as well the, um, out there, but basically we've broken down the weather into, into four, main, four main types of day category. Um, so we've got number one, a trending wind. So uh, this is where the wind direction is expected to steadily, steadily change through a time period, you know, or there's a persistent shift likely, um, and it's going to make a one side of the course dominant, or it's going to be the key dominating factor. You know, I guess if you sort of think about it very quickly, people would possibly classically think of maybe a sea breeze situation. Once the sea breeze is developed, it generally tends in the northern hemisphere to track right, and therefore you could say throughout the day you've got a, a, a persistent shift um, situation, so a trending wind. Um, the next situation is a, is a shifting wind, so a predictable pattern, an oscillating breeze. Um, are we able to pick, pick that up in any given, given time? Or, um, or you know that there's a, there's a sort of a, a maximum range in your, in, your, in, your, in your wind. So that would be a, another type of day. Then you have a, a gain feature uh, being a type of day, but that's also probably very venue situation as well can can create a gain feature so sort of land on left might mean stronger breeze convergence down that down that shoreline and therefore you might always be looking to to defend that left hand side um, but also um, you know it could be uh, that um, that you, uh, that again you have a have a I mean predominantly game features are, are land mass orientated and then finally probably unknown who knows eyes out sell <laughs> sell with what you see <laughs> largely we probably find most days fall into this category sadly but um, it is still you know every every bit we can uh, can determine and uh, so it is important that we uh, that we uh, look into all the different situations. So um, I sort of wanted to talk through um, uh, a frontal passage first of all. Um, I think fronts are probably one of the things that everyone, uh, everyone classically, um, oh, sorry, classically uh, gets qu quite confused about, or it can be quite confusing. A lot happens, um, but trying to break it down into relatively simple um, situation, um, and also trying to just just help us identify some of the some of the key things. So I mean, here's a, this is actually uh, an example of a frontal system from. Uh, I think it was uh, last week sometime, and um, and as you can see, you look at the look at the chart, and it looks pretty complex. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fronts, um, and there's all different types of fronts. Um, largely, the the ones with the triangles on, they're cold fronts, and the ones with semicircles are warm fronts. And then where you've got triangles and semicircles, they're called occluded fronts. And occluded fronts is basically where a cold front has caught up with a uh, with a uh, a warm front. Um, but uh, and therefore uh, its features are slightly uh, more complicated. Uh, they're a bit more merged together. But I guess the, the the key thing with it is to is to look at a chart, identify what frontal systems you do have coming over you, and then to start thinking about um, how that frontal system is is going to is going to affect um, the area. I think the key thing w with frontal systems, again, is identifying the visual cues. How will a front manifest itself? What am I going to see? So it's all very well saying there's a front coming, but then it's trying to go, OK, what am I actually going to see when I'm sat on the, on the water? Um, and obviously, things like satellite imagery and radar imagery are really useful for being able to see where the front is right now before you go out, and also to help you see, to help you uh, think about what, what um, clouds you're going to see, how it's going to approach, and, uh, and how that might happen. And uh, then the sort of the importance of each change, you know, it might be that, you know, what you're going to see is increasing cloud, but actually that's fine, it's not going to affect me, other than the sun's going to disappear and it might get a bit chilly. But realistically, it might not actually make any difference to your wind at the surface. So it's also then trying to identify what the important changes are. You know, like with a warm front, the rain comes ahead. Is that significant on the wind, or does it just mean I'm going to get a bit wet initially? Um, and then also, um, you know, how confident are we in predicting when that front's going to come across? Because we might know what's going to happen, and we might have a timing, but how confident can we be, you know? At what point on the water do we go, yeah, we know, here comes the front, the wind's going to go right, 
let's go, let's go uh, over and get ready for the shift. You know, let's head towards the right because here comes the shift. And so also having a good understanding of and having your confidence in, the, in that frontal system timing is another key thing. Because the last thing you want to be is out on the right hand side and actually it doesn't, it doesn't go right and you're hung out to dry. So um, we're going to just look at a frontal system to begin with. Um, this is obviously a nice classic, very, very easy to look at. Uh, classic system, got, the, got um, what, it, what the synoptic uh, chart would potentially look like at the top there, um, with a warm front and a cold front, classically drawn, and then a cross section through, uh, through the system so that um, we can see what might happen at any given point in terms of the cloud and the rain um, and you know, the system moving. So imagine um, along the bottom here we've got um, miles, so you've got up to 600 miles ahead of a, a warm front and then up to 400 miles behind the, behind the cold front. Um, and then uh, we've clearly got marked the, the, the frontal systems. Up the, up the side we've got feet basically, so that's height in, height in feet. So I guess the, the, the first thing we look at is if we're sat in front of the warm front um, and what we're saying is up to sort of 600 miles ahead of the warm front, you can start to see some influence of that front. And that is in that you start to see high cloud. So, you know, you can have a front warm frontal system that is, uh, you know, currently right now we could have a warm front um, to the west of, uh, uh, well to the west of the UK. And we, if it was a nice clear day, we could already start to see high cloud coming in. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the influence of the warm front. But does that have an effect directly on the, on the surface? No. We've just got increasing cloud, we know it's there. And I guess if you're, you know, for us offshore, if we start to see that, we know the warm front's there and we're probably progressing towards it and it becomes a bit more of a, hang on, that's all gonna happen a bit quicker. And then obviously as we, as we go through, uh, the, the cloud gradually thickens. So all of this is big, big thick cloud. And um, also probably one of the other key things that we see happen is um, any sort of cumulus clouds that are around, they begin to shrink in size. And that means that the air mass is becoming more stable. And it's becoming more stable because there's warm air over cold air, so the air can't rise as much. And so if, if air masses are coming more stable, then generally your wind direction and your wind strength, the ranges of those tend to, tend to reduce. So you tend to get less gusts and less shifts because obviously your air mass is becoming more stable, your clouds are becoming smaller, you're having less influence, of, of the, of, uh, less influence from the clouds essentially. And then we're still 200 miles away from uh, the actual warm front and, it's, and it can potentially start to rain. And again, it's falling out of higher level cloud. So again, the immediate effect on us at the surface, it's probably not a huge amount other than we're gonna get wet. Um, but in terms of the wind direction and strength, that's, that's fairly, uh, fairly minimal. And then uh, eventually we end up with thick cloud and rain on the front. And then once the front goes through, the rain clears. But the, the key thing here is while the rain clears and the cloud breaks up, it doesn't clear entirely. It ends up, you still have a lot of low cloud. And probably warm sector is what's responsible for a lot of our lovely gray days that we have in the winter. And you, uh, sit and you get up, you look out the window and you're like, oh, another, another gray day. And it's warm sector conditions there. Just that blanket cloud, very, very flat based cloud. Um, and, uh, and, very, uh, and with that, it's very stable. The warm sector, there's not a huge amount of mixing because it's all warm air, nothing. You don't get these nice puffy cumulus clouds that give you showers and gusts. It's all flat-based cloud. You tend to get that drizzle rain that somehow gets you more wet than any rain ever. Um, um, but one of the key things there is, as it's a, a stable breeze, you tend to get less shifty winds and also, again, um, again uh, uh, less, gust, uh, less, less, less uh, gust range. So I think, you know, arguably if you were sailing and a warm front went through and you were racing ahead of a warm front and then after a warm front, you, you're likely to find your type of day could change. It could go from being quite unstable and shifty to something that's uh, more stable, uh, more oscillating. Um, so you could go from at this point here being a little unknown to potentially being we're in a nice, stable, um, oscillating breeze. And then if we look ahead to the, the cold front, cold fronts are typically a lot, lot easier to spot. They tend to come along uh, with some big black dark cloud, really strong rainfall right on the front, and then bang, big clearance behind. So often when you see a front coming, a cold front, you can actually see the bright blue underneath it almost behind it. You can almost see the clearance before you've got the front. So a cold front is arguably a bit more predictable. 
Um, and then also as the cold front goes through, you can expect the wind to go round to the round to the right, as you'd see by looking at the circulation above, you can see from the arrows how the how the wind direction is expected to change. So we do expect a, a wind shift on the warm front to go potentially from a, a southwesterly to a westerly in a classic way here, and then from on the cold front from a westerly to a northwesterly. Um, but the cold front is obviously much easier to, to spot. And then once you're in the cold air there, you can see, again, example, the cumulus clouds classically building. So conditions getting more unstable, um, the depth of the air more well mixed. So again, you're, you, you're getting more um, gust, mean to gust ratio. So sort of putting that into, to sort of summarize it all and, uh, and looking at what we uh, have as the, the key features from each of those elements, I guess what we, we're really always coming back to is what's the what's the type of day if we we're in any part of um, that weather system. So, got in the, this column here the, the type of day, um, and as you can see, as I said, sort of the warm front approaching, increasing, lowering wind, wind direction steady, a gradual change over six to eight hours. For most of us racing, that's probably not really going to influence us on the race course, and we can be relatively confident at that point in what's happening that the breeze is is gradually shifting. As the warm front comes, uh, overcast, low cloud, persistent rain, again, potentially trending left a little bit before the front, before it then kicks round to, to the right, um, but no consistent trends, and it's, and it's quite unstable in that frontal system. And so it's actually quite, the, you know, confidence in what's going to happen is, is, pretty, is, is pretty low to moderate. Like being able to pick a warm front out on any kind of imagery or even on any given day is really hard. Um, potentially, if you had temperature, you could use that. But even then, I think it's pretty hard to, to pick one out. I would never really punt on the timing of a warm front. Warm sector conditions, again, generally, you know, confidence in warm sector conditions is, 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 is reasonably moderate because there's not a lot changing. In theory, you should have a nice steady breeze. You've got overcast cloud. I think, you know, occasional outbreaks of rain. But otherwise, you're not expecting any big changes if we, if we look back at the classic example, oops, sorry, the classic example of the low there, you know, you can see obviously it's very classically drawn, but in the warm sector there, the isobars are all very straight on the pressure system, therefore suggesting little to no change. Um, and then, um, and then uh, obviously at the bottom there, we've got the cold front. Um, as I said, you know, classically you see the, the good visual, you can have a good visual um, on a cold front clearance, and so therefore, again, your confidence can be pretty high on when that's coming through. And you know, probably the key thing we're looking at there is that shifting breeze from the from the from the wind to go round to the right, and uh, and that being one of the the key factors. So it's just identifying uh, uh, that that visual clearance and using that and picking a moment to uh, to take that. So I think you know that's a sort of a, a fairly simple way to break down what can be quite complex systems when looking at a frontal system to work out how you can use the uh, information um, and also to sort of understand that with that, to, under, to have that understanding of the frontal systems to be able to relate it to a forecast. Because most of us look at sort of wing guru or, um, or magic seaweed or all the different, or all the different things that are out there um, and get our forecast and, uh, and it gives us a forecast every three hours, and the wind direction will be here, then here, then here. And unless you have an understanding and can relate that to why that wind direction is changing, it's actually quite hard to use that forecast. So again, it's always important to kind of combine the knowledge with, with, with then the forecast so that then you can say, OK, is forecasting a change round in the breeze because I know there's a front coming through and it thinks it's coming through in this three-hour period. It doesn't overly help you because it's still a three-hour period, but then you can use your eyes to hopefully identify a bit more. Um, and I guess sort of that was, you know, probably more classically happens in the open ocean. A lot of us sail here on uh, inland venues. I grew up sailing at a place called... Weirwood Sailing Club and a really tiny pond called Piddinghoe, um, just outside of uh, Brighton. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not quite the same at an inland venue. And that's largely because what happens is as the air mass or any front comes over over the land, it gets hugely modified. You know, a lot of uh, the high ground will make it rain out early, and so the fronts often weaken, and also they don't, you know, we don't have that nice classically drawn um, uh, low pressure system. And so I think there's other things that, that are more relevant for, uh, for, a, for an inland venue, um, and, uh, and that's uh, stability. 
stability is probably one of the key things everywhere, but I think with regards to inland venues, that's one of the things that we can really sort of uh, work with and identify to help us understand how our, how our day is going to be and what type of day we're going to have. We can still break it down into the type of day, but it's just uh, more based on, uh, on stability. And in these um, two examples here, you've got very uh, low cloud. That's actually over Weymouth. Um, but you know, classically over, uh, a classic low cloud there. And also some, some fog in the image on the, the left, both showing very stable situations, but for, but for different reasons. And yet also a reasonable amount of breeze. Um, so yeah, so basically stability is, is sort of one of the, the key things for um, inland venues. Um, so thinking about stability, um, I guess, I don't know what people out there think would, if I said it's an unstable day, it, it depends what people, you know, people probably have a different view of what that is um, in terms of the weather, there's a very definitive answer to this, but um, there are many interpretations of unstable and stable. Uh, you know, these are just obviously some classic examples of Leaning Tower Pisa probably looks quite unstable there. Um, but in the sailing world, we probably think if we saw this wind trace, if I just said, here's a wind direction trace, cool, do you think that's stable or unstable? You know, we'd probably look at it and go, it's moving around quite a lot, it's, it's unstable. But um, actually, I would say that this is a shifty day, not an unstable day necessarily, because um, instability is to do with the mixing in the atmosphere as opposed to how the wind direction and, uh, and, and wind speed changes. Obviously, it has a, has a direct link, but when you talk about stability, we're talking very much about um, how much mixing is going on in the atmosphere. Um, so, as I said, in the world of uh, weather, um, unstable is defined by the vertical movement in the air around us. Um, and an unstable day means there's lots of mixing in the air, lots of, uh, lots of air rising. Um, and I guess visually, classically, you'll see big towering cumulus clouds or um, on any frontal system, you would say that's unstable because the air is rising there. So, and it's rising over, over a large depth. So that's, um, that's sort of the, the key things that, that we're looking for. Um, you know, and this is, a, a, again, an example like in a, in a sea breeze, you would see air rising and you start to see signs of the instability when you get your nice little puffy white clouds. But obviously there's levels of, levels of instability. Um, but that's sort of what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be trying to look at what the visual signs are that help us identify how unstable or stable it is or how that stability is changing, um, which we can use while we're out on the water. So um, here we go. What can we see? Um, is it unstable or stable? What might change? And what effect will this have on the, on the wind? So obviously, big, big cumulus clouds and equally nice big, it's actually a, a frontal system uh, coming along. So, you know, most likely we would say this is, this is unstable. Um, then also, what's, what might change and then how, how could this then, then affect us? So I think there's sort of always key things to, to think about. How's this going to affect us? And then if something changes, what does that then mean for us? So, um, you know, first of all, unstable. Obviously, this is a huge cumulus cloud, so it's much more unstable than the left, left hand picture, but still very unstable. And what are the key things that this will, how will this affect us? Um, predominantly, you're going to be looking at cloud position and that the clouds are probably going to be dominating your wind in that situation. So obviously, as and when the clouds either move position or change or start to change size, then that's when you've got to think the effect, how the effect is going to um, change. So essentially, in this situation, we're looking at cloud, a cloud-driven cloud system. So again, when you're inland and also, um, and also uh, sailing uh, at the coast, you know, you can very much see potentially clouds come down one side of the lake or cut, cut, across, cut across your course area. And so it's just identifying, uh, identifying that. Um, here we've got another example. Um, they have probably not so easy to see the top right hand picture. You've got that funny smudge that you see on the horizon that just looks like we've polluted our planet. Um, but basically, you can just about see it, it's a bit yellowy, and that indicates that there's uh, an inversion and that, that, it's, that it's a stable day. All of these, all of these images show uh, very much a stable day. You know, the, 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 the cloud can't go any higher because something's stopping it. So it's, um, so it's very much limited in how much vertical mixing there is. 
Um, and in fact, in this case, there's only cloud forming because the wind's coming from the southwest. It's forced over the high ground. Not that that's massively high, but it's forced over it, and that creates a cloud. Otherwise, uh, you know, but it's a good, it's a good example of, no, of working, of seeing how um, stable um, the situation is. So what would we expect? For something to change, we need there to be heating. Um, so it's a stable situation. If this is going to change and become more unstable, then we need there to be sunshine and heating. And as you can see in all these situations, there, there would have been. Um, and then we'd see that haze lift. So that dirty smudge on the horizon will gradually clear and dissipate. Um, we'll see the cloud lift up and turn into a little bubbly cumulus um, and, uh, and, and, um, or, or any cloud break up. And I think the, the other thing that would, would change is that you'd see, and initially you'd have quite a stable situation, so, uh, you know, slow oscillations in the breeze, potentially predictable, um, and then what would happen is with the heating, as that changed, you'd find that um, it becomes a lot more shifty, and the, and, the, and the time period between the shifts becomes shorter. So again, you know, you go from perhaps, um, you know, uh, sailing a race where it's a, it's, a easy, it's a predictable shift pattern, you know where you're going to be going, and then you, uh, and then it changes to it being a much more shifty day and, uh, and you know, it might be sort of 10 shifts a beat versus three shifts a beat and, uh, and suddenly uh, your type of day and how you uh, approach that race course uh, will change. And then we have uh, another example here just to sort of show how it can change through the day. So this is, again, down in, uh, down in Weymouth, but this is uh, through, the, through the period of the day in the morning. We had a nice amount of cumulus clouds bubbling around, and by the afternoon, they'd all, all disappeared. So again, I guess, you know, what potentially could have, could have changed in that day, has, has that meant any effect to our, uh, to our, um, to our sailing? And um, basically, because there's a bit of cloud around, that shows that it's initially slightly unstable, and then as that cloud gradually diminishes, then conditions are getting more stable. So, you know, there's not as much mixing going on. So, uh, therefore, you'll find that initially, you're probably trying to, as everyone says, sail in the blue bits, try and work out how to sail around the clouds. Um, but you're trying to sail on the edge of the clouds. You're getting little shifts off the clouds. And then you're finding much later on that the pressure's a lot more even across your course area. And your options are probably a lot more, uh, are, are very different. Um, and the reason this has probably happened is most likely that a high pressure system is just gradually building over the whole, um, over, the, over the area. So you just get a gradually building high pressure and that will slowly flatten out any clouds. And, uh, and gradually bring bring stability to the area. So those are sort of um, some of the some of the things that, that can um, that can help help you identify things more on the water rather than just using using the theory. Um, and obviously, stability is is key for um, sea breezes. And as we get to March now, even though it's practically snowing and or it is snowing in the north of the country and I had to scrape more ice off my windscreen this morning than, than ever this year, believe it, believe it or not, it's turning to spring and getting warmer. Um, and so we're going to be looking at um, sea breezes developing. And again, a sea breeze needs um, good mixing and needs, that vert needs to be able to have um, some vertical ascent because obviously the sea breeze uh, relies on the land getting warm, the air rising, and then, and because of that, cooler wind is pulled in from the sea and uh, the air rises and spreads out. Um, so therefore, you know, we would like good mixing like the picture on the, on the bottom rather than the picture on the top where, I, as I said, it was, uh, it was quite stable and there's effectively what you call an inversion, which acts as a, a lid. You know, the air can't rise above that inversion, you know, which is why I've got a very, very sharp line. And obviously, if we have that, um, if we have an inversion in our sea breeze cycle, then suddenly we're limiting how much the air can rise here and suddenly we're actually going to have a very small circulation. So that's why if you get up on a nice sunny day and you're like, oh, it's warm, it's sunny, this is going to be great for a sea breeze, there's not much wind, but then you look out and you can see that really strong, dark smudge on the horizon, or you can't see any cumulus clouds developing, then it's likely that you're in this situation, there's an inversion around. And that means that you can't get your sea breeze circulation going, and you'll either get a very weak attempt at a sea breeze, or you'll get nothing. So it's often, it often seems counterintuitive that the longer the high pressure lasts, and the sunnier and warmer the days get, 
that actually the longer that stays, the worse the, the, worse the situation is for a sea breeze to develop. Um, because the inversion is getting lower and lower, rather than it being, oh, wicked, another sunny day, it's even warmer today, isn't this great? So I think that's of, often um, slightly counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're, again, stability is a, is a really key thing. Um, and there's sort of a few ways in which um, uh, you can get inversions, and as I've uh, talked about already, high pressure. Um, so a high pressure gradually is effectively sinking air over the, over the area. So the longer the high pressure lasts, the more the air sinks and almost the lower you end up with, a, with an inversion. But basically, an inversion is warm air over cold air. So obviously, with a warm front approaching, that's warm air coming over the top of cold air. So again, effectively, you'll get an inversion gradually forming. And then radiation cooling, which is what um, we see typically in the mornings, which is what gives us that little haze layer generally is that just the surface cools off overnight and you end up with a layer of cold air sat on the surface initially. And sometimes you can get up in the morning at sort of six, seven o'clock and be like, oh, there's no wind. And then suddenly nine, 10 o'clock, the temperature just gets high enough, breaks that inversion and bang, you've got breeze. So um, that's, um, that's sort of uh, radiation cooling. Um, and so then sort of taking that on, we're then gonna think about sort of putting um, sea, the sea breeze formation um, into uh, a bit more, a bit more, putting a bit more theory behind it. If we're, you know, assuming that all things are great, we've got our, we're happy with how stable our day or unstable our day is, we're then going to look at, um, use what is uh, known as the, the quadrant theory to uh, determine how well our sea breeze will develop. Um, because they actually, d d it does develop quite subtly. It doesn't just rely on, uh, on a nice, um, on a nice uh, sunny day. We've got, if I just go back to this image here, one of the key things we're looking at with this circulation um, is, if I, let's just get rid of the inversion, um, is, is, is a limb, is actually to have an offshore element above. So is for the breeze above us at sort of uh, 2,000 foot, so the breeze aloft to actually be pushing that, pushing that breeze back off to help complete that circulation. Um, and so, the, so that's what we're, we're looking for. And essentially with that, we're looking for identifying the gradient winds. So the, the wind, at, wind at 2,000 foot, which we can tell from the general direction of that from a synoptic chart. So when you look at a synoptic chart and you see the, the lows and high pressures and the, the, way, the, the way the wind goes around those give you, gives, you the, um, gives you the gradient direction. And so then we'll use that to um, break down our, uh, our uh, sea breeze development into four different sectors. Obviously, uh, no land is a nice straight line, but for the, the sake of theory, we assume a nice straight line and everything breaks up into four, four little quadrants. But uh, as you'll find when you go to any venue, you'll actually end up adjusting them into four sectors rather than four neat squares. Um, but I guess the key thing, and this is obviously related to the Northern Hemisphere, not the Southern Hemisphere. If anyone's going down under and wants to put this theory into practice, it's all a little different down there. Um, but basically, you're looking at identifying that quadrant, uh, the quadrant that you're, that you're in. So, this, so the sea breeze directs the, the gradient direction and how that will then impact on developing your um, sea breeze. So the gradient direction, as we said, is from the synoptic chart. And then uh, what we're saying is if it falls into, so let's take the example of the south coast of the UK, just because it's easy. Um, if it falls into the northwesterly sector, so anything from west around to north, if it's in that quadrant, if, the, if we've got a, a nice northwesterly, then essentially we're calling it a quadrant one. And typically that will be when we've got low pressure over the land and, uh, and, high, and therefore slightly higher pressure out to sea. Um, and then these are some of the um, things, that, the, the sort of traits that we can expect. This is the best, um, best quadrant for the sea breeze development. So you'll have your strongest sea breeze when the gradient is in, in this direction. Um, but typically you'll start with that offshore breeze. So you'll start with a, with a, with a weak um, northwesterly breeze. And depending on what part of the, of the country you're in depends on how strong that gradient breeze can be. Because there comes a point where if the gradient, if that initial wind is too strong, then the sea breeze can't actually um, overcome it. Um, but essentially, it, it, this is sort of the, the, the typical traits that you'll see. It develops inshore first. You know, obviously, we always get the classic boat park breeze because we all stand in a nice concrete boat park typically. But um, generally, the, the sea breeze will develop uh, inshore first. And also throughout the day, it'll actually 
be closer to the, it will be stronger closer to the shoreline, which um, isn't always of much use given where, a lot, where we um, often race. But it is in, in some areas where you have a bay, then it becomes more significant. Um, it will also get to, get to the strongest uh, wind strength, as I said, and it will persist for the longest. You know, it can last up until sort of 8, 9 o'clock at night on a good, good English summer day. Um, so ideal conditions. Um, sea breeze would develop around 11.30, um, 11.30 to 12.30. It will be strongest between 2 and uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, uh, and then it returns to the gradient-driven direction, the northwesterly. So again, something to think about is that, you know, once it's developed, if you're still racing later on in the day, is then it starts to uh, break down the sea breeze, is that you're actually looking for this, the breeze is going to return back to that northwesterly. So you could find that you go from sailing in, uh, in your southwesterly to that northwesterly, coming back in, uh, and that, that again could be... Uh, a key element for, for your uh, racing at the, if you're at the end of the day. And then if we, uh, this is just an example of the, uh, an example of a synoptic chart showing the gradient setup. So we've got high pressure uh, to the south and low pressure to the north. So we've got effectively lower pressure over the land than, over the, than, than to the south of us. And effectively a nice northwesterly gradient. If you imagine, obviously the wind goes clockwise around the high. Um, so you've got a bit of a, a west to northwesterly gradient over the south coast. So that's the kind of classic setup, 5th of July, 2010, lovely sea breeze day. <laughs> and then um, if we go uh, forward and look at now quadrant two, so again, we've still got an offshore element, which is still good for our sea breeze circulation. So the wind aloft is still going to be blowing offshore. Um, and all this means is it's just not, uh, it's not aligned as well because because of the gradient direction, you've effectively got slightly higher pressure over the land and lower pressure over the sea. And obviously, when land heats up, it creates lower pressure. So it's got to sort of overcome that difference and create, a, um, create, create the opposite pressure difference, which is why it is essentially slightly slower to develop, and the way it develops is slightly different. So rather than developing first along the shore, it tends to develop in patchy bands, and also the breeze can stay quite banded. Um, the max wind strength as well will be less than a sea breeze formed from a, from a quadrant one. Uh, so again, ideal conditions, um, sea breeze will be delayed, so probably one to two hours, so looking at rather than 11.30, potentially more like 12.30 to, to 2 o'clock. Um, it'll be strongest still at between 2 and 3 o'clock, but again, it'll be a little bit lighter, typically between 2 and 4 knots lighter. Um, and, uh, and also, as it, as it decays, it's also going to try and go back to the gradient, but this time the gradient direction is obviously um, the northeast. And if you imagine a sea breeze when it's all up and running is uh, in, the, in the southwest, so the transition from the decaying sea breeze to the gradient will be a lot more complicated and a lot trickier, um, uh, and, uh, and it will be uh, harder to predict. Whereas with the quadrant one, when you had your sea breeze in the southwest, and the gradients in the northwest, it hasn't got far to go. Yeah. And then uh, again, just an example there of a uh, of a quad of a of a setup there for the uh, for the sea breeze there. And so then, just going through uh, quadrant three. Um, so this is where you've got a, an onshore surface breeze. This is actually what you'd call a, a thermal enhancement. So uh, you already have wind at the surface, and actually what the heating to the land does, rather than creating a true sea breeze, it actually just adds a thermal uh, influence to it and uh, effectively increases the pressure gradient. And so you, so you end up with a stronger breeze, the breeze just increasing above what the gradient would give. So effectively, you'll always have wind at, the, wind at the surface. You're not waiting for anything to form, but you're basically just in a building breeze day. And it will try and trend towards the mean sea breeze direction. So those are sort of the, 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 the differences. And obviously, this would be more of a shifty breeze than a, a nice classic sea breeze, which you could sometimes mistake this for because they come from a very similar direction. Um, and again, just a little example there, you know, low pressure, but nice southwesterly breeze, sunny day because we're behind the front you'll get a, get a thermal enhancement. And then uh, looking at finally the uh, quadrant four, just again, um, this time you've got a week onshore from the uh, southeast. 
Um, the problem with this is, again, you've got the high pressure and high pressure over the land, so the heating's got to overcome that, and also the wind direction isn't helping that circulation cell. So it's actually going to be really hard for the, for the sea breeze to develop. And in an uh, ideal situation, delayed start, or you be very late in coming in, and it would be very uh, patchy and, uh, and shifty. Um, uh, and uh, you could see a very light sea breeze uh, develop but uh, essentially it will be uh, quite a week and that's the worst situation for a sea breeze. So in this situation, there's an example, got a nice uh, high pressure over the UK and that's likely to give you a, a quadrant four. And so I just then wanted to sort of then finish up with um, you know, sources of, of weather data. Um, I mean, there's obviously multiple sources out there. Um, newspaper, TV, radio, obviously they have to cover a large area. They're quite generic and therefore appear inaccurate, but it's just because of the, the resolution. Um, websites, multitude of sites, um, the majority using the same weather model, so just really be aware of that. And obviously then grid files with a separate weather service provider. And rather than really actually um, pointing you into one particular one, because I think they all have their different mer merits, I really wanted to sort of just give some advice on how more best to use the forecast rather than actually go, hey, just go to this site. Um, and uh, I guess the sort of the key things are is to whatever site you use, they all have an about or find out. And it's, you know, know where your weather data is coming from, know what the resolution of the weather model is, because you can go to two sites and think, oh, this is great, the forecast is the same on, two, on these two websites. It must mean the forecast is really good. But actually, it's just the same weather, it's the same model, it's the same data, so it's the same information. Um, and, uh, and also, always compare real-time information because uh, a forecast is only a forecast and uh, the reality is really what it's all about. <laughs>